We want to talk about a particular type of German Gothic sculpture. It's known as the Andachsbilder, or one Andachsbild. Um, Andacht means, well, docked is a thing, to think on or to contemplate. So these are images, Bild, to think on or to contemplate. So they are devotional images as opposed, for example, to narrative scenes where you have um, you know, a whole story told. These are images for personal devotion. Uh, you could be in front of the you could be in front of the image uh, and imagine you were there, you know, seeing the crucifixion, uh, seeing Mary and Christ, and having a very intensive emotional and personal devotional experience. We think the strength of the emotion in these works um, and, and this idea of contemplating these images may have something to do with the influence of Rhenish mysticism. Uh, there were a number of German artists from the Rhineland uh, who, uh, the number of German mystics uh, from the Rhineland, and that undoubtedly uh, would have had some influence on the art. Now, sometimes I like to say that there was German expressionism in the Middle Ages. You know, there was an art movement in the 20th century uh, that we call German expressionism. Well, there was expressionism in Germany in the 14th century and the 16th century as well. Um, and this is, we're going to point out some of this 14th century sculpture that is directly related to what we often call effective piety. In the late Middle Ages, uh, there was more and more emphasis on what we say Christ as a human being. You know, it was very well established that Christ was divine, and now uh, a lot of the devotional literature reminds us that he really did suffer, that he felt as a human being. And uh, you're often advised in the devotional literature to, to um, accompany Christ or Mary throughout her life or his life. And you are supposed to have a very empathetic response. In other words, you, you, know, you might feel like you're really there. You might weep. You might strike your breast and say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. I caused my sin. You know, Christ died for my sins. I caused Christ's death. Um, and to elicit that kind of response, the artist may go, you know, take naturalism to and exaggerate it um, to give you this very strong emotional response. And once again, uh, this is often associated, uh, why is it happening in Germany? Uh, it's associated with the Rhenish mystics. Okay, one of the types of, um, of these devotional images, one of these types of these Andachsbilder, uh, that we see uh, numbers of them, uh, different sizes, different places, is known as the Pestkreuz or the Plague Cross. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's also associated with the idea of, of course, the plague uh, came to Europe, um, uh, entered in from France, moved throughout Europe uh, in the 14th century, shortly before the middle of the century. Uh, and that's one reason they call them plague crosses or pest cruises, because they think that they may also be associated with this idea of suffering. Uh, and trying to, you know, people, people thought, you know, they, they would call on God to deliver them from the plague. Um, and, you know, many of them thought if they, if they flagellated themselves or suffered or prayed and fasted, you know, that uh, 
that this would help to bring an end uh, to uh, the Black Death. Um, it's probably not only the Black Death, it is all of that whole idea of effective piety. Um, now, in this case, you see Christ's suffering, and the forms are almost painfully exaggerated. Christ is shown as an emaciated figure. Uh, his body is bloody. Uh, many of the, uh, these statues, uh, particularly the wooden ones, are painted, uh, and they will paint the blood, uh, dr coursing down the body, dripping from the wounds. Uh, they're very, as you can see, there's very angular forms, which of course, uh, angular forms uh, suggest the idea of pain and suffering. Uh, and in this case, of course, the limbs, the arms, for example, are stretched out. Uh, this is the Pes Cruz from Santa Maria in Capital in Cologne, uh, and it dates from the early 14th century. Uh, there are other ones. There are large crucifixions uh, for display in churches. Um, I remember the scene one in uh, uh, St. Jerome in Cologne as well. Um, and then there are very small ones. So here we have this... Uh, small metal cross uh, from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Yeah. But the same emphasis on exaggerating forms, on the suffering of Christ, um, and doing everything they can to elicit an emotional response from you. Yeah. You see these, you should be weeping. Now, there are other Andachsbilder. Um, as we say, it's a, a kind of general title talking about all of these devotional images. Um, and one way they developed was to take a detail, a, a very emotional detail usually, from a narrative scene, and that detail becomes the focus of devotion. And two of the subjects that we see are well, in Italian, it's known as the Pietà. So you've probably heard that. A Pietà is Mary holding the dead Christ. And this is taken from the lamentation over the body of Christ, where you would have a picture of Christ uh, maybe lying on the ground or lying partially on his mother's lap with uh, Mary Magdalene and John uh, the Evangelist and uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and uh, the holy women and angels perhaps all lamenting over the body of Christ. Take out the two main figures, Mary and her son, Christ. Taking them out of the narrative context and you look at the suffering of Christ, you look at the suffering of Mary, um, you meditate on this. You say prayers in front of it. Uh, you may weep in front of it. Um, and another that you, you see these very, very frequently. I know um, when I was in Germany, I, I felt like almost every church I went to had a picture, a, a, a statue, uh, a late medieval statue of Mary holding the dead Christ. Uh, some were beautiful, some were exaggerated, as the one you see here. Um, and another scene that you see uh, a number of is Christ with St. John the Evangelist, the beloved disciple. Um, and you can see sort of, the Bible says he, lean, he uh, reclines on his master's breast, so you can see him sort of leaning over, uh, resting his head against Christ. Uh, this is taken out of the Last Supper. Um, and so here you have that you know, love of Christ and you know, the beloved disciple. This particular Andachsbilder um, is one that is very often photographed and very often shown. It's, it's in the um, museum in Bonn. Uh, Andachsbilder means devotional image, and we often call the uh, images Vesperbild. Vespers, of course, is the uh, canonical hour that takes place at sunset. And so it's kind of like a picture to... Uh, image to contemplate at Vespers. Uh, and we, you know, in Germany, instead of calling this a Pietà, they often will call it a Vesperbild. But it does not have to be 
Mary holding the dead Christ. It could be another subject such as John uh, reclining uh, on his master's breast, on Christ's breast. So here we see uh, this wonderful image of Mary holding her son. It is, it's Mary holding her son on her lap. So it reminds you of images of the Virgin Mary holding the Christ child, you know, that relationship of mother and son continuing. And it also shows you that Mary is suffering. Uh, it's that she suffered in her heart or she suffered in her soul as Christ suffered in his body. And, you know, you look at this and you see, you know, the, the exaggeration, the large heads, uh, the angular forms, uh, the blood that is painted as, as coursing down the limbs and through the body of Christ. And this particular one has a really um, striking feature of the globules of blood at the wounds of Christ that really resemble globules of, of grapes. Uh, it looks like you know a bunch of grapes um, and makes that relationship between the blood of Christ and the wine of the Eucharist. What do you do when you look at this? You know, you weep, you lament your sins, but cause the death of Christ. You know, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. You know, my fault or my guilt. My, my extreme guilt, my maximum guilt. Devotional literature emphasizes the suffering of Christ and emphasizes the suffering of Mary. Uh, and it also, of course, has the theological idea that um, Christ is the sacrificial victim whose death atones for the sins of all mankind. And it also... Uh, we read in, in late medieval devotional literature and theological literature that Mary suffered in her soul as Christ suffered in his body. And here we see that emphasis on the blood, not only the painted blood, uh, but here carved with these globules that uh, you know, mark the wounds. And of course, as I said, that refers to the Eucharistic wine, uh, the wine of the Mass, uh, as the blood of Christ. And of course, uh, you know, at the Last Supper, Christ is supposed to have taken the chalice or taken the cup and blessed it, uh, blessed uh, the wine and the cup. And he said, uh, for this is my blood, which shall be shed for many for the remission of sins. That's Matthew 26 to 20. Uh, 26th chapter, 28th verse. Um, you also see Christ's body broken. And uh, when you take, take uh, communion and uh, the, uh, you receive the bread, which is the body of Christ, this is, this is my body, which will be broken for you. Um, it is the Corpus Christi. And in the Catholic Church, when you uh, take uh, communion and you take, uh, you take the body of Christ, the, the priest says to you, Corpus Christi. Um, it, this is the body of Christ. Amen. And here you see uh, two different versions uh, of uh, Christ and St. John, you know, uh, just love of uh, his follower. Uh, it's called the beloved disciple in uh, the Gospel of St. John. And uh, you know, the closeness, the affection, and the awareness that the viewer would have that Christ will, shortly after this moment, will be arrested um, and suffer and be crucified.